I want to talk about the book, but tell you also about my process of writing it. That means all the mistakes I made, all the wrong paths I took, all the things that went wrong. And because I think most of them will apply to you as well as, as writers. They are just common things that happen to writers. Um, and those of you, I think Mary said, uh, you're not writing, maybe you will after we are done with this. But even if you are not, you might be interested in just hearing the details of the story. Um, if you could show the first slide, Sarah. Um, this is, these are two quotes that I think would be nice to guide us off uh, into a story about the past and about history, because it is in large part about the importance of history in my grandfather's lives. But by extension, I hope you'll think about the role of history plays and the past plays in your own lives. So you know, there's a famous quote by Faulkner that the past is never dead, it's not even past. But I also like the uh, great Gatsby quote, so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Um, I thought that would kind of set us off on this journey. Um, this is my, um, I had never written a memoir before and it was triggered by a document, in my case, a diary. And I would like to ask you maybe to tell us or put it in the chat, if any of you have written, has it also been a document that got you started? a letter or a photograph or a diary or anything, because that is often the case that people find something and then they suddenly start looking into uh, that story and uh, it eventually becomes a family history or a memoir. Um, I found this diary after my mother's death. It was hidden behind books in her Vienna apartment. And I recognized this very tiny, but actually very legible handwriting right away because my grandfather always had written poems for me to recite at Christmas and New Year's and, and so on. And I had really spent the happiest years of my childhood with him. Um, I'd been moved around a lot and he gave me my first stable home and uh, was both father and grandfather to me. So. I started to read right then and there. I know it was, I remember still, it was late in the evening already and I was tired, but I started reading. And I read about that this was um, his day by day. You can see every day is marked, you know. Um, it was a daily account of what it was like in Berlin in 1945. That meant the day and night bombing, the fall of Berlin and the, um, incoming Soviet occupation. So I read about, you know, the terrible conditions. Maybe go to the next slide and then to the next slide, Sarah. Then. Okay, and then um, Katie mentioned that she has her grandmother's diary from 1920, um, answering your question earlier. Um, Andrea has all the photos left at her grandmother's house after she passed. And Kay has an old map from the 19th century that showed the spring she had photographed. Oh, great, great. Yeah, I mean, documents, and it's often a chance encounter with them, right? Either after someone's death or you just come across it in papers and or some other relative mentions it. And uh, um, that then gets you started because I had no idea I was going to do this. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Um, this is my grandfather. I called him Api affectionately. That doesn't really mean anything in German either. I mean, just as little as it does <laughs> in, in English, but that, you know, small kids sort of come up with names. If you go, um, I picked this slide because in the diary, there's a passage that says where he writes, dead horses are cut up in the midst of bombardment, the meat eaten almost raw. No way of cooking, no water, no light, God take pity. And it was obviously, as long as there were still horses around, this was quite common that this happened in, in Berlin because people had, were starving and oh. um, they, they would, uh, you know, eat the almost raw horse meat. Oh. Um, he also wrote about medical cellars 
uh, in which he worked, he was a doctor. That's why when we had fled Berlin, he stayed behind because he was needed as a doctor. Um, and the medical cellars not only didn't have beds, people just lay on the uh, cement floors, but they didn't have water and they didn't have even light. So it was terrible conditions and the uh, stench was everywhere and the, die, the dead were simply stacked outside. And outside the streets, if you can go on to the next three slides, I think, Sarah, um, the streets were buried in rubble, although my grandfather's apartment was just to the left here of the Brandenburg Gate. Um, he almost did not recognize the landscape and he had to make his way over these mounds of rubble and through uh, cellars of buildings that had been destroyed. And um, because there were fires everywhere from the constant bombing, the uh, smoke made it hard to breathe. In addition, there were thousands upon thousands of refugees who fled before the Soviet army and they had come into um, Berlin and they were living and for a large part dying in the streets of Berlin. So the stench of corpses was everywhere. So it was a terrible uh, situation and I felt for him and I thought right away then at that night I decided I'm going to tell the story of the diaries, both as a tribute to my grandfather, but also as a historic document. So I took him back with me to South Bend to read them more carefully. And then I discovered something that stopped me in my tracks completely. I can still remember the moment when I finally realized that my grandfather had been a member of the Nazi party. That became clear. There were sort of allusions to it earlier, but I read over them, but suddenly it became clear to me. And I just kept sitting there saying to myself, oh my God, Api was a Nazi. And I just couldn't think beyond that. Um, I did then what my mother had done, and that is I hid the diaries. I put them way in the bottom of my desk and I didn't tell anyone. And even after, I don't quite know how long it was, but it was many months when at one point, totally unexpectedly, I told my husband, Mike, my secret just burst out. I hadn't planned it, but you know, that is how it sometimes goes, you know, that you just tell him. And he urged me then to tell the story of the diaries, but I still couldn't do it. It just felt like a betrayal. And then it was a book from a different time and a different place uh, that finally pushed me to write. I was working on, some of you know, um, another book I'd written called Better Homes of South Bend, an American story of courage. Mm -hmm. It's about workers in the Studebaker plant here who had come from the South um, to escape Jim Crow. And then as one of them so famously said, mm -hmm. we met Jim Crow in the North. And they decided that they had not left all their home and their family and then raised their children in this a terrible environment and where they were forced to live. So they decided to build the first um, building co-op in Indiana, African-American building co-op. At any rate, as background for this, I read a book um, by Edward Ball called Slaves in the Family. Do any of you happen to have read that? Um, it's, it's a very interesting historical account of the slaves his family kept. But when he told his own family that that's what he was going to do, they were outraged and they were angry and they were upset and they tried to stop him. And one of them said to him, you're going to dig up our grandfather and hang him. And I could understand where they were coming from because I in a way felt the same way. And um, Ball responded that no, he was not responsible for what his grandfather did, but he was responsible to account for it. And that sort of was the push. It so fit my situation in a way. And that was the push that overcame both my resistance and my shame to write this. Um, but I still had a lot to learn, both about history. I'm an English professor. I never read much about the Nazi period. 
And growing up in post-war Germany, it was sort of eerie in a way. And I think of it now, I, when as you're a child, you don't think about that, that the Nazi period was never mentioned. It wasn't mentioned at home. It wasn't mentioned in public. It wasn't mentioned in my school where we had a fantastic education, so good that I could, from graduating high school, I could have got my BA within one year. I took an extra year in order to apply for a scholarship, but that's how good the education was. I had French and Latin and English and um, you know algebra, everything. But history classes ended with World War I as if nothing happened after that. So there was this complete silence. So I needed a lot uh, to learn about that. And also about my grandfather, he grew up in Prussia and I read Prussian about Prussian history and it is such a violent history, right from the Teutonic Knights who came in the 13th century and displaced the original inhabitants who weren't sissies themselves, who kept saying, priding themselves on roasting the knights like chestnuts, um, but they lost out. And after that, uh, it became Polish fiefdoms, the uh, knights were thrown out and then Bismarck Germanized it. And then of course, during the two world wars, um, it was taken over by the Germans, by the Poles and by the Soviets. And all of them were violent. Um, you can see that even talking about it, I'm getting sidetracked in a way. And that's exactly what happened to me as I was doing this because I had learned from previous books that you always, always have to do research and writing together. If you just do the research and don't write, you lose control of the material and you don't quite know then where to go. So I had been doing that, but despite that, I got very much uh, sidetracked into all this history. I wrote all this down. And I don't know whether that happens to you, but once it's written down for me, it's hard to, to get rid of it or delete it. So it stayed in draft after draft. But I was losing focus. It was even, I was vaguely aware of it that I was, but I just wanted to get all this new material out. When you learn something new, you get all excited about it. and you just want to you know, communicate it. Uh, and so it stayed in there. What I ended up with was a manuscript of seven super long chapters that essentially followed chronologically the history of Prussia and then my grandfather and then my grandfather's story, still mainly focused on the time in Berlin in 1945, but it was just unwieldy and, and huge. And I sent this off to my agent and she wrote back that in a way she was very kind and very enthusiastic, but what she said to me uh, was that I needed to put more of myself into this story. Now that stunned me because I had written quite a number of books before, but I was always keeping myself at a safe distance. So I had no idea how would I do that. And what I, I did again, what I always do, I started to write. And something happened there that way, because as I started to write about my memories of my grandfather, my experiences with my grandfather, the memories just poured forth faster than I could take them down. I just went on and on and wrote, and it just, it just was amazing. You were, you were sort of in a zone. Um, Sarah, could you show a couple of, uh, I think it's three slides about my grandfather. This was, is one still in Berlin. Um, so I'm two and a half, maybe two, two and a half years old with my grandfather. Um, this is, we were um, refugees in a little cottage in Northern Germany, uh, just in one and a half rooms of a farmer's cottage. And he can't have been happy because he didn't have much space himself and he was fairly poor. And uh, my grandfather did some um, of his, um, he was an eye doctor and surgeon. Uh, he saw patients in that one room, but for the most part, he liked to go and make house calls on his bike. And when the weather was nice, he took me with him. And 
I always loved it and she told me stories and we laughed together and we had a great time. Um, and the, the last picture is uh, we are now in an apartment finally that was six or eight years, six years later um, and getting more established. And I, you can see I'm doting on my grandfather. Um, but what happened in a way when I think of it now, it, I actually hadn't thought of that before I prepared this talk here. Um, in a way, I my story switched from a family history into a memoir. And this, I don't know whether you've had that experience that the borders between those are way more porous than you think. You think you're doing a family history. Um, uh, will you show the next couple of slides? This is just a sort of aside. You probably know all this, but you know, it usually goes over generations and it has mainly dates and facts, and it's not from a personal perspective, whereas the memoir is personal and intimate. And what particularly distinguishes a memoir is that it focuses on a particular time or a theme. An autobiography stretches over one's whole life you know, until the moment one, where one is when one writes. But a memoir just deals with one thing. It can deal with childhood, it can deal with a divorce, or with a particular relationship, or with any kind of theme like addiction and so on. And it has insights beyond the personal. And that can happen in a family history, but usually doesn't. So I always thought of them as fairly separate. But you can move from one to the other too, and in your writing that may happen. Um, and all of them are part of what is now called creative nonfiction. Are you familiar with that term? At all? That's what people call nonfiction now, essentially, creative nonfiction, because they realize that any story isn't real life, right? Even when you tell a story about what happened, uh, what you saw in the street or what happened in the grocery store or anything, you rearrange the details for effect to make an impact to tell the story in the best possible way. And you have to, of necessity, leave out details, right? All the sensory details that we are bombarded with. You can't possibly say all of those. So there is already a fluid border between fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and when you then add research to it too, which you then incorporate in your memoir, or in the story you are telling, you know, again, you are mixing uh, uh, genres and they'd like to call it now creative nonfiction. It is an act of creation, although it's basically dealing with a nonfiction subject. And I like that quote from uh, Lawrence Slater, who says, if your memoir is really good, really honest, really from the roots of your heart, you yourself will not even know what is invention, reinvention, and what is really real, because the act of remembering imaginatively blurs those distinction for you forever. Um, and there is a truth to that, right? I don't know when it, um, I know uh, some of you have already written uh, or started to write um, a memoir. When you start writing these things down, then what you are writing down becomes the real memory, right? Uh, so um, the touchstone here, though, the important part is to be honest. And I think, strangely, readers know when you're not, when you're just trying to fabricate something. So honesty is absolutely crucial. So that is when I found, and we'll talk a bit more in a moment about that, found my voice for the book. And those of you who have written, uh, I, want, I want to tell you a bit about me, but then I'm really eager to hear about you because that happens to all writers. And it doesn't unfortunately happen usually with the first draft. It happens after you revise and revise. As Mary Carr says, I revise and revise and revise. Any editor of mine will tell you how crappy my early drafts are. Um, voice does not happen to you right away, but it does happen. And the most outward obvious change was that from these seven mega long chapters that I had written, 
it turned into 62 short ones. Uh, the spine, in a way, of the story, you know, the backbone of the story, still was Arpi's story as he recounted it in the diaries. But now it got intertwined with my own story. And what you find out is really how much liberty you have in doing this, in mixing times and places and so on. I want to give you just one example um, that how I moved between my grandfather's record of what he describes and my own experience. Um, in one chapter that was called Seven Kilometers of Documents, um, I'm writing, I had contacted an archivist at the university archives and the of that, also of that Charité, that hospital, that famous hospital where my grandfather worked. Um, I'd contacted her before and asked her whether she could find out something about my grandfather who had worked at the Charité and who had uh, been at the university and so on. And she said, oh, sure she can. We have, after all, seven kilometers of documents here. <laughs> so um, I described then um, in that chapter called Seven uh, Kilometers of Documents, how Mike and I are in Berlin and of the 21st century, and we are going to find that place, those archives. In order to do so, we have to go to the Friedrichstrasse station, one of the big uh, stations also for local, uh, um, you know, what you call them, metro kind of station. And as we are climbing up the stairs, I remembered how my grandfather had written, uh, because he lived right near there and he had to pass the station in order to go to the one of the medical bunkers, how he saw at the end of April 45, days before the war was, uh, oh, the war in Europe was over and Germany was over, um, saw SS people who had hung two German citizens who obviously had worn uh, civilian clothes over their army clothes. They didn't want to fight anymore. And they put a sign up that this would happen to all cowards who are not, you know, patriots and who are not fighting for their country to the end. So as I walked up the stairs, I thought of that, but then you go into that hall and it was uh, cherry time and those Balaton cherries, those Hungarian cherries are just wonderful. And I bought bunches of them and they were commuters and the station was already done and so on. So there was this really clash of memories. And then we go to the archives and then the story switches because of what I read in the archives is about my grandfather being a student and then as a, his young career as a doctor. And I write about that. So that chapter moves between, you know, to totally different decades. And I do that on several occasions. And you can do it if you make sure that the reader knows where you are and why you are doing it like this. So there's a lot of freedom there. And the other thing that um, became much clearer was my discussions of uh, German guilt, of Arpi's guilt, and all our political responsibility. I had thought sort of crept up in those seven long chapters occasionally, but now I really found the place for them at the end of the book, after I had told the whole story, to not have answers, but to have reflections on what is political responsibility, what is Api's guilt as a as because he joined the Nazi party. And I was certainly thinking of um, Martin Luther King's famous quote from um, the letter from Birmingham jail, where he says, we have to repent not only for the violent acts of the bad people, but I'm paraphrasing slightly actually, but for the terrible silence of the good people. You know, there clearly is a political responsibility there uh, for all of us. And I also was thinking back to Edward Ball, who said, we have to account for the past. We cannot just, you know, brush it aside or think it's past. We have to account for it. We have to take responsibility for it. Not 
for individually having done it, but responsibility to have a clear accounting, to uh, come face to face with it. Um, Germany eventually learned that in the 60s, um, they did. Uh, they, you know, they did things like in small, I mean, there were um, markers everywhere, there were monuments, there were museums and so on. But they did another thing. Every town in Germany has little, um, well, maybe this big uh, bronze plaques in front of houses or apartment buildings where Jewish people had been taken and uh, murdered. So when you walk there, they call them uh, Stolpersteine, meaning stumbling stones. You are meant to stumble over that, to think about that, to be aware, to account. And uh, they did a lot of things like that. They really, uh, you know, not that you can ever make up or reparations, you know, they did pay reparations, but clearly there is nothing for it. But they did acknowledge as much as they could that this has been a horrendous thing that must never happen again. Um, so this was the point that I suddenly knew all this long history, the Teutonic Knights and all this stuff had to go. Um, and I did have no trouble now with this new combination of talking about my grandfather in 45, talking about his past, talking about my life with him, talking about me retracing his steps in the 21st century. With all that, I knew what had to go. But not all of it, not all the stuff I read. And there's one thing in particular that even as I talk about it, it always makes me feel all shivery in a way, um, but I kept that. That was a journalist, a Soviet journalist called Vasily Grossman. Um, he came to Berlin, but he thought since he had been reporting on Stalingrad um, that he could never be shocked by anything again. But then he came and saw the devastation in Berlin and the thousands of dead refugees and all this that he was shocked again. And as he walked around the city, he went into the zoo um, because he knew that the largest gorilla was supposed in Europe was supposed to have been there. So he was looking for the gorilla area. And of course the gorilla, like all the other animals in the zoo was lying dead in her cage. But the zookeeper came out who had looked after her for over 30 years. And they started talking. And at one point, Grossman asked him, was she fierce? And the zookeeper smiled and said, no, she just roared loudly. Humans are fiercer. And that still brings tears to, I don't know why. I just find that it, was, it also so fit the whole, my whole story and that whole situation that it became the chapter heading and it certainly stayed. You know, that was one of the, um, things that we call that I got through research and historical looking at historically that I kept. Um, so revision and voice. Um, it, oh, Katie, Katie mentioned, sorry, Katie mentioned that great. she had always been concerned um, that she didn't write memoir correctly because she said, I have a tendency to add some flourish to my memory. No, uh, that if, if it is something that you feel strongly and you feel that really expresses what, what you are writing, do it. And you can always later on when you um, have maybe a clearer way of where you want to go with this and so on, change it. But certainly uh, to begin with, be sure to write it down. Actually, that's one of the best. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Katie, because I think that's so important for all of us as we write start writing about something that is important to you, that's vivid in your mind, and write it as, with as many flourishes and as fully as you can. You know, try to see it and feel it and smell it and have all these sensory experiences that you can master as you are writing. And you'll be surprised when you do this, lots of other things will come as well that you 
never knew. For example, with me, it was when I wrote about my grandfather's death. Um, at first, you know, when he died, I just said sort of, you know, the conventional things, or oh, I will never see him again, kind of in, in this vein. And then as I was writing, suddenly I remembered something that I hadn't thought about for, my God, half a decade, I think. Um, you know, uh, half a century for 50 years. Um, and that was, I saw these gloves lying at the bottom of the stairs. My grandfather came home from looking after people in an old folks home and he rushed up to bed before collapsing and he died right then. And he never left things lying about and seeing these gloves just made an impression from, on me and nobody took them away. And the um, fingers of the gloves were still bent and they sort of looked rigid, death, uh, dead. It became an image to me of my grandfather's death. I had not thought about that. They haunted me for a while in dreams afterwards, but I had not thought about that. And if I hadn't started writing, I would never have thought about it. But also happier memories. I remember how we built a kite together and um, then we took it out to, to fly it. And it was too, the pull was too strong for me to hold on. So my grandfather ran with it and I ran beside him and we both fell into a ditch. And we sat there laughing and I still see us there laughing and watching this kite high in the sky, zigzagging high in the sky above us. It was such a wonderful experience. Again, one that I hadn't thought about in a long, long time. So no, Katie, I think it's important to do that and keep doing that. Don't let that stop you. Um, Thank and you. <laughs> the rewriting is important. And I think have some of you had that experience about that you suddenly sort of knew where everything belonged and how to say things. Nimbi, you must have had that with your, with your memoir of your childhood. I don't know, Gabrielle, I, but I agree with you. It's almost uh, not like um, that free flow of consciousness kind of writing, but to just let it go and not, because you can always come back. You're going to come back and redo it. But as it comes to you, because feelings will bring forth things that you thought that you had forgotten, and it just comes. I would find that for sure. Like uh, I might wake up in the middle of the night with uh, a thought about something that happened when I was, you know, eight, nine years old. And uh, to not get out of bed, but to had a, have a pad there that I could just scribble down that thought. And then the next day that thought would become a page or, or you know, maybe two or three paragraphs that had come from a single thought. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. It's just wonderful and amazing. And it's just that process of doing it mm -hmm. that triggers that. And as you say, it can happen at night. It can happen as you go grocery shopping. I mean, in, when you do something that's totally unrelated, when you're really into your subject, that will happen. But your book, uh, Gabrielle, I, it's such uh, just an amazing work. I mean, when I was reading that, I just, I couldn't imagine. And when, when you said that your agent said to put more of you in it, I could feel you in it, all through it, and what it must have been costing you to write it the way you did with uh, objectivity, but also with such a personal sensitive, you couldn't have gotten away from that part, but I, so I, I can't imagine you putting more into it. I'm not sure how you did that, but you said that you understood what the agent was asking of you. And yes, yes. Um, because I had focused more on just telling his story and doing the historical background research and so on, rather than also dealing with my struggle all along and, mm -hmm. uh, and my memories. And, um, 
Well, just having read just the, you know, your Better Homes of South Bend and then your, uh, uh, there, well, and it's, it's that, that I could see uh, because that was a work of uh, his, historical research kind of thing and interviews and talking to people. That wasn't your story. You were telling the story of a group of individuals here in South Bend. Uh, yeah. When it came to realized uh, who your grandfather was or, or, or at least one piece of who he was because yeah. the book talks about how he would go at any hour and all hours to, to take care of sick people everywhere you know there yeah and she did to... not flee he could have left Berlin right at that time. exactly he did but not he chose, do that but... yeah chose um, not to thus the the title I guess reluctant uh, yeah, in, in that. But the other thing I think that comes into focus when you have this voice and the, you know, art sort of knowing now wh where what goes and how to organize it. Another thing that comes is your ultimate message. Um, and, you know, I wanted it to be, show the profound impact the 20th century has had on my grandfather, but then also I hope that the reader will think about the impact. My God, we are living through quite a turbulent history even right now um, on our own lives. And But ultimately, I hope the message is one of empathy. And I think that is actually the power of memoir um, in that when you talk about the struggles someone struggles, no matter how different they are from you and the situation is or the time is, you are moved by that. And you begin to feel, my God, we are all part of, we have this bond of our common humanity and we have to um, deal with each other with tolerance and compassion. And I think the power of memoir is that it can generate this and it does usually, uh, the this, this stories do. Um, I want to end just quickly, but I would hopefully will hear from more of you as well. Um, could you go to the next slide, Sarah? Because it is so important to tell your story. It's not just something that you're, it is something you're doing for yourself, but it's also uh, important beyond that. You know, it preserves a past and a time that Otherwise, we'll be forgotten with, you know, our passing. It's a glimpse into another world and that teaches us something. It shows the, you know, here you see, I don't need to read all this. I love the Stephen King quote, writing about life leads to a fresh understanding of it. I write to find out what I think. I think that certainly did happen to me in, in this book in particular. But it's also therapeutic. Man, many times when you do a memoir or a family story, you come up against something that is painful or that shocking or that you are ashamed of or so. And writing about it helps you though to process those feelings and events. I mean, there's a real therapeutic part to it. And I think it fosters compassion and tolerance. So it's really an important thing to do. So I hope Katie and uh, Melody and uh, everybody, uh, Kay, uh, I don't know about uh, Andrea, um, uh, that you will do this, that you will write and uh, get started in a small way. You don't have to think of it, oh, my God, I'm writing a book and, you know, so long and how where will I start and so on. Just start anywhere where you, at the moment, feel something, have a, a memory, think of something. Don't worry about the structure. You could see how much I changed the structure of this book in the process of rewriting. But it's important to get started because that is your entry, your passageway into the whole thing. Uh, it's amazing, but just the act of writing, even writing on the, I thought maybe writing on the computer wouldn't do the same thing as 
handwriting as we used to do, but it does too. Um, any, any other comments? I have a couple of more things, but, um, oh, here. Sorry, I, oh, I didn't mean to go forward. Um, I was trying to unmute. Um, Andrea is a high school creative writing teacher, and she said you have given her some really great ways to get her students writing too. Right, and uh, Andrea, I mean, you know, you tell also the students, everything has a history, right? They can, I, I know some woman uh, said, I don't know whether she ever did it, she wanted to write the story of her life through the kitchen sinks she had owned, you know, just all the different kinds and how it progressed and got fancier and so on. But everything, if your students uh, took a train ride, right? They can go into the history of what was train ride like in the uh, 1950s or 1930s or, or something. Everything has a history. And um, it's maybe fun for them to find out and interview, talk to grandparents, you know, have students talk to their grandparents or um, their parents or so about something in their lives. And then do some more, a bit more research to find out more where, what was the time like? What was the situation? What were the popular songs at the time? The movies, whatever, um, you know, the history is just everywhere. And I think it might be fun for them to do it with their personal lives um, rather than, you know, just in the abstract. And the other thing, uh, Sarah, if you go to that next to last slide, um, it's way too brief, but read other memoirs. I just reread Annie Dillard's An American Childhood. Had anybody, has anybody read that? Mm -mm. It is so beautiful. <laughs> it's, you know, any, I, I like Annie Dillard anyway, but um, this is, she's such an amazing little girl. And She's telling the story and she calls it an American childhood. And I know why, because she's really talking about America's in the 1950s and 60s. And although she is not teaching us or you know, lecturing us about it, it just comes through the way she writes about it. And it's moving and um, breathtaking. It's beautiful. But the same is true of Maya Angelou. I know how the, why the cage bird sings or Richard Rodriguez in Hunger of Memory, which is sort of controversial because he was an assimilationist uh, Mexican, you know, who very much believed in assimilating and, and so on. Or uh, the only one that's a little way off is the Nabokov one, Speak Memory. That is, it's, it's funny and fine, but it's, it's a little different from the other. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk. St. Augustine, of course, is different too. He had a bit of an extra grind, but um, and uh, more, more recently, the Between the World and Me, which many of you probably have read. But it's way, mm. way too short. I should you should put in more. But thank mm -hmm. you, Sarah, for putting in the um, links to the library where those books are. But it helps too to read other people's memoirs. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have a, yeah, I created a, a list with the links to the um, books in the library. Um, and when my stop screen sharing, I'll put that in the chat so that you guys can grab that. But okay. I can't, I can't grab um, it my screen sharing, so whenever we're done, I'll. Just uh, flash up my contact information okay. for those of you who don't have it. You can either go on my website or on my IUSB right. email. Oh, it's gone. There it is. But feel free to email me. Uh, so, uh, you know, with any questions or we can then have phone conversations too, uh, I'd gladly talk to you. Yeah, Nimbi. I don't know uh, if my friend Shirley, I don't know what was said before I got here, but all of you know me and you're meeting uh, Shirley Suber, who's someone very special to me. Uh, did you tell them anything about us, Shirley? I did. Okay. I, okay. All right. But, well, uh, uh, is Shirley still here? Or? Yeah, she's still here. I um, see her. <laughs> I do hope you tell that story, Shirley. And I would gladly, if there's anything I can do to help, and you have Nimby too, who's uh, an experienced <laughs> memoirist. 
but that is certainly a story that needs to be told. Yes, Gabrielle, I look forward to uh, sharing with you uh, my story as well as everyone else, but I would like to share some thoughts with you, Gabrielle. Yeah, I would love to. It's uh, really something that... Yeah, so, so thanks for hanging in there, Shirley. Even though I wasn't here, that's so you. Yes, I was pleased to see her too when, uh, you know, she when we started talking. I was very glad that she was there. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to do the raffle? Yeah. Was that question? Okay, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Let me pull up that. Um, link really quick. But um, while she does that, if anybody else has any comments or questions, Linda, uh, are you thinking of writing a memoir? Well, you know, there are little bits of my childhood that come back to me, and there are some interesting parts of my life. Uh, and I'm do just did the family research, you know, got gathered some things for. Um, my half brother who didn't have all of my father's, you know, family history. And I just keep thinking that I'm of an age where I, if I have anything to say <laughs> to my <laughs> children and grandchildren. Um, so sometimes I do think about it. I have some images that keep coming back to me and seem to want to come out. I don't know if I'll ever do anything with it, but uh, Nimby, have you published your story? I yes. did. Mm -hmm. Can I find I it at the library? Actually, you can, and if, if, there, if their copy is too <laughs> worn and torn, I'll give you mine because I, I self-published and I used a, a, you know, a, a printer here and it was fine, but, you know, not necessarily the most durable. It's in paperback, but I, I want I, to talk to you about that. I think that book needs to uh, get published, published. Bless you, Gabrielle. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. All right. Um, oops. Sorry. I was trying to, I'm trying to put a link to Nimi's book in the catalog. I should have added that to. Oh, the good. Other, there is um, Nimi's book uh, in the, at the library. If you'd like to. Borrow Nimi, that. do you not have a copy? I could lend people uh, a copy. Yes, I, I have a copy. Um, that I would I, I could lend. I just uh, sent one to Shirley, and um, I have a copy that I'd be happy to to loan. Because to I do too. If, uh, I've, yeah, I've I've got like two copies left. You know, there's one that's oh well, you not need going to, to leave. Yeah. But but I'd be happy to. So Linda, you know, we can connect through. You've got my email, uh, League of Women Voters or whatever. But I'll I'd be happy to do that. Well, we'll check with the library first, but I'm glad to see I can find out more NIMBY. I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Um, did we get all the people, what they put in the chat, Sarah? Yes, that was every, all the comments that have been put in the chat. But yeah, anyone feel free to unmute yourself and just speak up if you have any other questions or comments. I have, hi, I have a question. Um, one thing that I've struggled with in the past in writing is um, how to deal with writing about real people who aren't me, who are still very much alive, and um, the ethical and maybe even legal ramifications of that. Um, so in writing nonfiction and in, and in recounting real events, um, do you have any advice for how to handle those kinds of situations? I'm very glad you brought that up. Actually, I had a note somewhere in my things here that I was going to mention that. So thank you, Melody. Um, there's, I, you know, I, I've read a lot what memoirs do, and they are very divided. There are some people who say, I run everything where a real person, even if I change the name, appears, I run it past them. Um, I tell them, this is my story and my perspective, so you may see it differently, but I want you to see it, and sometimes you learn something else from that. So that is one way of going. The other way is um, 
there's uh, a woman who wrote a blurb on my book and has published several memoirs. She never told her family and they disowned her. They and broke off with her completely. She knew they didn't want it and she didn't tell them and she published anyway. And uh, they disowned her. Um, I don't know whether the legal, uh, I'm not, uh, if you don't uh, say something, you know, make an outrageous lie about someone, I don't see how you would be liable legally, but uh, um, it's more the, as you say, the ethical or the, you know. Well, and then see the uh, Edward Ball, the slaves in the family, right? They didn't want him to write it and he did anyway. Um, but if you feel you would hurt somebody's feelings by, um, I would, two things I would see, is this particular event or person, is that essential for my story? Do I need, is that really part of what I need? Or could I just let go of it? And if it is, maybe have a conversation with them um, but that, that is dangerous territory in, in a way about in family relations, right? You could offend somebody who then don't want to speak to you ever again. Thank you. Um, but that's a very good question and that is tricky. Many people certainly change the names. Um, yeah. um, the actually another memoir, recent memoir that's very good and I could have put in there is Educated. Oh, okay, yeah. And she clearly says pretty oh, yes, it, terrible it, it, things about especially her brother, uh, but everyone in uh, many in that family. And um, she changed the names, but I don't know whether people wouldn't know by the location and everything anyway. And uh, I vaguely seem to remember that she did have some problems, but I, I'm not quite sure. Okay. But that was a tough one to write. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I'll look, look into that. But do get started and feel free to contact me. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Is it about your childhood, if I may ask? Do you know? Um, more, more my teenage years. So but everyone yeah. in the story is very much still around. Um, and one of them is my ex-husband. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's complicated for sure. But that is important too. I mean, A, for other teenagers to see, you know, the problems and to see the problems as they also relate to a certain time and so on. It really is important stuff you're, do, uh, you're doing if you write that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and thank you all for coming. You know, we think where we are all kind of locked down in our houses and have all this time, but the days just fly by. And I think one has less time than, uh, uh, in, no, in the normal circumstances. So I'm really grateful for all of you that you did make the time and uh, did come. And it was good to see, see you all, both old friends and new.